couple weeks ago, I had two voicemails. One was from a friend who was in the midst of crisis. Another was from a friend who was celebrating a job promotion. I made sure to call back the friend who was in the midst of crisis right away. And it took me longer than I'd like to admit to get back to my friend who had just received a job promotion. That same night, I went home and I ate dinner with my family. And I talked to the boys about how their school day was. One of my boys had had a great day at school. And he said, it was a great day, Dad. And I said, awesome. And then one of my other boys said, well, it was all right. And I dug deeper. And we spent 10 to 15 minutes talking about the fact that his day was rough. Where we just glossed over the fact that my other son had had a great day. As soon as he said things were good, we just moved on to the next conversation. Later that night, one of my sons was flipping through the different apps, and he put on an app that started the news. And if there's anything in the world I don't want my kids watching right now, it's the news. And I'm like, buddy, we don't need to watch the news. All they ever do is show the bad stuff. Maybe you've heard the old saying. There's an old saying in the news industry, if it bleeds, it leads. If it bleeds, it leads. Meaning, if news is bad, it's going to get a lot of coverage. But if news is good, it's going to be diminished, if reported at all. And I'm not going to teach my kids at the age they are, if it bleeds, it leads. But I'm just going to tell them, listen, th this, is, this is always going to be where they just highlight bad news. If, if you're a fan of the president at the time, you, you will grumble about the fact that ev all the coverage is negative. And if you're not a fan of the president at the time, you're like, because everything they're doing is negative. But the news is always, it always seems negative. And I, I just sat down, I'm like, buddy, the news is always negative. And then it caused me to think about my reactions that day that I didn't jump and return the phone call of a friend who was celebrating. And as soon as one of my boys told me that he had a great day at school, we just glossed over that. And how even as somebody who doesn't want to spend all their time on the negative, I found myself guilty of this dynamic. And right now, the world has no shortage of supply of bad news. It's everywhere. And it's not where it used to be where the news was just reported a half hour or an hour during the day. Now it is constant. Where even if you don't go out and seek it, apps will now send it directly to you, whether you asked for it or not. We are inundated with horrible news right now. And so today, today we're going to talk about good news. We're going to talk about the best news news ever. We are going to talk about the gospel of Jesus. Now, if you're not part of a if you're not part of a church family normally, maybe you grew up in church, maybe not. Maybe, maybe you have no idea what this is, but maybe you grew up in church and so you heard about the gospel all the time and it just became another word to you, but understand what the gospel means. The gospel literally means good news. And today we are going to talk about the best news ever at a time I can't think it would ever be better to spend some time talking about good news. And so if you have your phones or your tablets and you're not watching on them, you can follow along with us on the Bible app. It's a great resource that we highly encourage everyone to utilize. If you're following us from afar, the best way to find us is to type in our zip code, which is 54201, 54201. There you will see Lakeside Community Church. You can follow along with us right there as we are going to be reading portions of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, one of the most detailed chapters in all of the Bible on the hope that we have as a result of what Jesus did on our behalf. And so today, that's where we're going to be. Follow along with us, if you would, please, as we start in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, where we read these words. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, 
and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. He says, here's your reminder. Here's your reminder about this good news. This good news, this good news is your foundation and your salvation. This good news is your foundation and your salvation. I'm originally from Northeast Ohio. And just a couple days ago, right where I come from, there were some massive storms that happened. And in the process of that, a tornado touched down and it went through and it just wreaked havoc over some parts of, over some parts of the area where, where I originally grew up. And it took me back to re remembering growing up in Ohio and and every spring, it seemed, we would get some of these storms where the threat of a tornado would happen. And it wasn't as bad as Tornado Alley, where tornadoes wouldn't regularly touch down. But there would always, seemingly, always be the threat that there was going to be a tornado. And when the weather would see the warning signs and they would issue a tornado warning, we would go into our basement. That's where they said was the safest place, to go underground in the basement. What is the basement? It is the foundation upon which the house is built. And in the issue of a storm, it was our security. It was our security. The good news of what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf, it is our foundation. It is what we are to build everything else of our lives upon. This is the starting point. This is the firm foundation. This is the most important thing that we have to figure out. That our lives are to be rooted in this truth. The truth that we're going to discuss in just a couple minutes. And not only is this our foundation, but it's our salvation. It is our security. It is the reason that in the midst of these trying and uncertain times, we don't have to live being plagued by uncertainty. Because we have hope in something that is bigger than a vaccine. We have hope in something bigger than flattening a curve. We have hope in something that never changes and never fails. And that is the great love of our God demonstrated for us through the work of his son, Jesus. So we continue in verse 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. And he says, here's, here's the gospel. Here's the good news. Here's the message of hope. I'm boiling it all down. Here is what changes everything. This truth. That Jesus is God. That Jesus is God. That he died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again. That is the good news. That is the message of the gospel. That is our hope. That is our foundation. That is our security. That we have a God who created us. That all of this is not just happenstance. All of this is not just some random chance of some probability, but that there is an intelligent designer in God. And because God designed everything, he gets to make the rules because that's what happens when you create something. When you create something, you get to make the rules. And so God has a standard because God's perfect. And God's standard is perfection. This is where the bad news starts to come in. In all this good news, there's a little bit of bad news. And the bad news is, I don't make that standard, and neither do you. It's not a question of whether or not you're good enough. It's, it's not a question of whether or not you can do enough, because the answer is you aren't and you can't. 
you aren't good enough, even if you're really, really, really good. Because somewhere in your life, there is that mistake, there is that regret, there is the thing that you don't want anybody else to know that you carry and you hold on to. And if you could do it all over again, you would. And you're not alone in that. Every single one of us has that. But God loves us in spite of that. It doesn't change his standard because God's a God of order and he has a rule in his, his standards perfection. So he made a way for the imperfect, me and you, to become perfect. Elsewhere in, in scripture, in fact in the next letter that Paul would write to this church that we're, we're looking at today, he writes these words, that God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, who was perfect, to be sin for me and for you, to be sin for us, to take on my imperfections and to take on your imperfections, to take on my mistakes and to take on your mistakes, take on my sin and to take on your sin. So that in him, so that in Jesus, our relationship could be restored to God. That we would be made right with God. And so God substituted my mistakes. And he gives me perfection because he sent Jesus who died on the cross. Because the cost of our mistakes to a perfect God is death. And so he sent his son Jesus who paid that price. Who died on a cross. This is the good news. That he was buried. And that three days later, he rose again. And if you're thinking, well, this is crazy. This is crazy. You're not alone. You're not alone in that. But here's, here's the point. And don't miss this. Don't miss this. He says, I know you probably think this is crazy. I know you probably think this is crazy. So guess what he did? Guess what he did? He then showed up. This was his equivalent of saying, I'm proving it. First to his friends. Then to over 500 witnesses. Over 500 eyewitnesses see Jesus after he is pronounced dead by an execution squad who regularly killed people. After he is buried. He raises again and then appears to over 500 eyewitnesses. Imagine that witness list if you're a juror. You're thinking, can, can we just already declare the verdict here so I can get on with the rest of my life? I really don't enjoy jury duty. I have better things to do. 500 witnesses saw Jesus alive. And notice this subtle, this subtle phrase, and yet this good news that we can latch onto today. He appeared to more than 500 at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Do you see it? He's not talking about narcolepsy. He's not talking about the fact that they're taking a nap. He's talking about the fact that some of those people, since they saw Jesus, have now died. But check this out. The whole dynamic of death has changed. The fear is gone. The hopelessness is gone. To the point that he now likens it to falling asleep. To taking a nap. We skip down to verse 12 where we read these words. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Here's what he's saying. He's saying if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, your faith is useless. If Jesus is not risen from the dead, your faith is 
useless. Our hope as people who follow Jesus is not in a cross. Our hope is not in a cross, but rather an empty grave. Because if the grave is still full and Jesus does not rise again, then all that means is that hell wins, that death wins, that sin wins. And the reason that he says, if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, your faith is useless, is because it means there is no way for us to be restored to God. And there is no hope. The crux of our hope as followers of Jesus is not in the fact that he was crucified upon a cross. The crux of our hope is in the fact that days later, he rose again. And he changes the whole dynamic and discussion around death. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, you have no hope. It's that simple. If Jesus did not raise from the dead, you're hopeless. There is no meaning, there is no purpose. Not only is your faith futile, essentially so is your life. If Jesus is not alive, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, the dead we have nothing to look forward to he continues in verse 18 then those also who have fallen asleep in christ have perished if in christ we have hope in this life only we are of all people most to be pitied. Let me read that again. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Do you understand what he's saying here? He's saying if all we have, if all we have is the example in the life of Jesus, if all we have is the example in the life of Jesus, then pity us more so than anybody else. Forget the message of love. Forget the message of peace. Forget the message of hope. You know, some people who want to say, well, Jesus, Jesus had a, a lot of good ideas. He had a lot of good ideas. He wasn't God, and certainly he didn't, he didn't raise from the dead. But he, he had a lot of good ideas, so I'm just going to follow those ideas. Why? It's pointless. It's absolutely pointless to follow Jesus if he did not raise from the dead. And that's not me saying that. That's Scripture saying that. That if Jesus is not alive, the worst thing you could do for your life, the very worst thing you could do for your life is to follow his teachings. If Jesus is not alive. If Jesus is not alive, do whatever you want. Live however you want. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about others. Live with only your own purposes and your own fulfillment in mind. Because if Jesus is not alive, we are to be the most pitied people of all. And yet, we have over 500 eyewitnesses. Many of whom, at the time of this writing, could declare, no, 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 no. I've seen it with my own eyes. Some had even touched the wounds that Jesus still had. It's all about the hope that we have because of the resurrection. So 
Jesus. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. He says, take heart, don't lose hope, understand why this is such good news. This is such good news because God is greater. He's greater than death, he's greater than hell, he's greater than our regrets, he's greater than our mistakes. God wins. And where we once had one destiny in Adam, the first human that God ever created, and who brought in death to this world, which was foreign to God's design, but is now a part of something that all of us will experience. As death was brought in through one person, which changed the destiny for all of us, so one, Jesus, brought life. Adam brought death. Jesus bought life. When he paid the price for our mistakes and our sins and rose victoriously. The destiny for all is death, but the destiny doesn't have to stay that way. Because Jesus purchased life. For you and for me. Through what he's done, he's made it available to us. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then it is coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God. The Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is is death. Jesus restores everything. Jesus restores everything. And his final act one day will be the destruction of death. That we can experience life because Jesus bought life and he offers it to us freely. That if we would make the choice to give our lives to him and accept what he has done in our place, we could experience the life that Jesus bought on our behalf. That it is ours. And that death will be wiped away. That we will live forever as eternal souls with the eternal God who created us. With this longing for more. The longing that is within each and every one of us that sometimes we push down and sometimes we ignore, but we can never completely reject that within each and every one of us there is a longing for something more, for something bigger, for a purpose that is greater than beyond us. And when we look at the summation of all that is life, we just shake our heads and say, there has to be more. And the reason for that is because God created us with a desire for something more. The eternal God created us in his image to have a relationship with him. Jesus has made that possible. We skip all the way now down to verse 53. It's a really long chapter. We skip all the way down to verse 53, where we read these words. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written. And here, here is the good news. Here is the good news for you. Here is the good news for me. Check this out. Death. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's just puffing out his chest right now. He's just puffing out his chest. 
He's channeling his inner Hulk Hogan. He's channeling his inner Conor McGregor. He's channeling his inner Joe Exotic firing off a video to Carol Baskin. And he's saying, Death, you got nothing on me. Death, you can't take me out. Death, where is your victory? Oh, Death, where's your power? Where's your sting? You have been defeated because of the work of Jesus. And it is the greatest news possible that the coffin and the crypt don't have the final word. That our mistakes don't have to define us. That we can live with a purpose. That is greater than us. Through what Jesus. Has accomplished. For you. And for me. That our destiny of death. Doesn't have to be what defines us. But that we understand. That Jesus life and that is the good news that gives us hope today and every day and it's available to you it's available to you right now in your house if you would just hold fast to this good news, to this gospel. And he says, what is the gospel? That you, right now, just understand and you acknowledge that Jesus is God. The God who created you and the God who loves you. He loves you. That you've made mistakes. You've, you've got regrets. That you've sinned. That you've fallen short of that perfection. You might be a really, 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 really good person. But it's just not enough. Because that standard's perfection. And you just can't make it. But Jesus made it for you. That if you right now would just whisper this prayer. God, I want to give you my life. I know that you love me. I know that you sent your son Jesus to die for my mistakes, to die for my sin. And he paid the price for all of the things that I've done wrong. But death didn't win. And because three days later he rose again, I put my hope and I put my trust in you. If you whisper a prayer just like that and believe it in your heart, you've just received the greatest news possible. That God loves you. Now for those who've whispered a prayer like that. Or proclaimed it loudly. Or shouted it from the rooftops. Whatever the case may be. I want to leave you with the last verse of 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says this. Therefore my beloved brothers. Be steadfast, immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the result of our hope. This is the result, that we are to stand strong, that we are to stand strong, that our foundation and our salvation and our security is in Jesus. And as a result of that, we live what Jesus taught. We live love. We personify it. We never stop serving others. We never stop engaging with people. We constantly love, love, love. We don't stop serving and this. Remember, always, always, always remember, we win. Because Jesus won. He is victorious. And 
this is the good news. God, I pray that we would be people who cling to the good news. In a time that people are desperately seeking and searching, I pray that we would not be driven by fear. I pray that we as people who follow you would personify love. I pray that our lives would radiate with hope. And I pray we would never lose sight of serving others. God, let your good news overtake us. And let it be clear to all who would look at our lives that hope is prevalent. Because while our destiny was death, you have bought our life. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. Thank you for dying for me, for my mistakes, for my sin, for my imperfections, for my regrets. And thank you for being victorious so that I can experience hope. And death is not my final destiny. In your name we pray.